get the cost to come down, or C, get somebody else to buy it for you. I don't know. I don't know. If there's another option, and we need to do all three of those in a measured way, in my opinion. I talked about pathways. People, the best affordable housing program is a well-paying job. And you say, well, Lou, that's a generation away. Well, not necessarily. Uh, Clarkman's Community College, I'll just tell a real quick story. There's a, there's a guy over there, there's a man who teaches uh, uh, computer-aided design equipment, digital equipment, um, I can't come to the word, but um, CNC, CNC equipment. And it's a two-year program, and he turns out people to run these CNC program these equipment. That's all well and good. But he went out and talked to folks in the neighborhood, in the business community, and what they told him was, we need that. We need programmers. But we just need CNC operators. And so he partnered with some businesses there in Clackamas County, and they put together a program in 12 weeks, taking me or you in 12 weeks and making them skilled enough to run the CNC machines. They graduated the first cohort, February 16 people. Every one of them had a job. They ranged from ages 16 to 60. And those are not minimum wage jobs. So it is possible to provide skills training in a relatively compressed time period. So more land will reduce the cost. Skills training, um, there's things we can do in terms of permitting and so on to help reduce the cost. And then there are people who cannot take care of themselves, absolutely cannot take care of themselves. We need to provide for those. Um, and that's not just giving them a place to live, that's giving them resources, counseling for addictions, mental health, things of that nature. Uh, and so we need to provide that kind of housing, you have to build that. I'm all for using public money to do that. And then finally, there's this, um, what I call bridge financing. So if you're in poverty today, and you got daycare problems, no transportation, no place to live, it's kind of hard to go to Clackamas Community College, even for 12 weeks. So, so people need transitionary housing. Uh, but you know, we don't build hospital beds for everyone who gets sick. We don't build hospital beds for everyone who gets sick. You get sick or injured, you go to the hospital, you plan to get out. We don't need to build you a new bed. So we need the same thing in terms of transitionary housing. If you're, as I said, you've got some millstone of poverty and so on over your head. Yes, let's provide housing, but let's provide a pathway to get out of that, quote unquote, subsidized housing and make it affordable by virtue of income and building the cost curve. Okay. Uh, so with relation to transportation, uh, you spoke during the presentation about the issue of the bridge over the community park. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and a, a couple of uh, alternatives to be able to uh, decrease the traffic load on 12 Road and other roads in the area. So what do you think was behind the uh, uh, kind of the debacle over the community park bridge for future generations? You well, to this reporting. how did it fail? Yeah. Um, there, there were a number of contributing factors. I think the, the, the largest one was uh, I and others on the council sort of took it for granted that people would think this is a good idea. Um, and largely, people did think it was a good idea. Um, but we, the, the North Tualatin neighborhood, in my opinion, had a perception that there's going to be this huge arterial that was basically going to destroy the sanctity of their neighborhood. And if I had that perception, I'd be fighting back just as hard. So it's not, it's just not a majority statement. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, the done properly, engineered properly, you could have a connection, the extension of Lower Boone's Ferry Road, all the way to, through Herman Road, from, from I-5 to 99W, providing this parallel route to Tualatin Sherwood Road and provide increased mobility, you would, uh, in my opinion, you would repurpose uh, Tualatin Road, because now it's the, it's the northern arterial. It's what everybody uses uh, to get into the north part of town, but to get through town, to get east and west, and west in the evening, east in the morning, to 99W. So why would you want that bypass going through your neighborhood today? That's what happens today. Uh, and so if you reverted that back to a local street, put a planter strip down the middle, put uh, bump outs on it where, you know, where cars have to go slowly, um, and I don't mean speed bumps, that too, but I'm talking about the bump outs and the curbs or the crossings and so on, and make it look like a boulevard, I mean, a park type boulevard, uh, and then access the neighbors for that. You'd have to, I, I believe you would stop the access of Teton Road, for example. 
you know, you have to think that out because people want to get to their houses from the south. Maybe they want to use Teton Road. But that's a major industrial road that dumps onto Tualatin Road. Likewise with um, the next one down, 115th, 108th. So, you know, repurpose those so that you have North Tualatin be its own sanctuary. And have the traffic going down Herman Road the way it was designed to go in the first place. Okay. Uh, yeah, so with the issue of parks, uh, I know that we're currently going through our uh, master plan update. Uh, the, the committee is working very hard to try to uh, create a sustainable plan that will be able to last us. Uh, ho hopefully, we'll have to use it as long as use the last one. But there have been a lot of changes in the parks over the past 20, 25 years, uh, including the pump house, the dog park, Keokuk's Bridge, and a number of other developments within uh, Tualatin Community Park. Uh, what do you think is behind those changes, and what do you hope to see in the future? with regards to the changes in our park system? Well, the items you mentioned, um, the key cut bridge is probably the centerpiece to all that. And again, that's something to be very proud of. That was a, a multidisciplinary partnership. The original uh, design or engineer's estimate on that was I think about a uh, million dollars uh, pedestrian bridge. Um, by the time all the requirements got put in place, it had to be wide enough for emergency vehicles, therefore it had to be concrete, it had to be a free span over the river so we didn't scare the fish, uh, and a number of things, and it cost him three and a half million dollars, I believe. As I recall, the city of Tualatin, I want to say put in like 185,000, but it might have been 300,000. Whatever it was, it was a small portion of the total cost. We partnered with ODOT, we got federal transportation money, we partnered with the city of Tualatin, city of Tiger, Washington County, Metro and Clean Water Services uh, to build that bridge. And you mentioned the, the pump house. So right now we have an ordinance, or excuse me, we have a charter amendment that says you can't build anything in a park unless it's park purposed. That's not exactly right, but that's the intent. So we could never have done what we did on that park without a vote of the people. And we could, and so we'd have to get a vote of people to put the pump house in. Putting the pump house in, and you're recording this, so I'll try to be as, uh, <laughs> as appropriate as possible. But a pump house is a device that moves the effluent from your toilet to the water cleaning uh, treatment plant uh, across the river. And uh, CWS is going to spend a lot of money to underground that under the river. So they put a lot of money in toward the Kita Bridge and hung that pipe underneath the bridge. But they required putting that pump station there. You can never put up pump station in a park today without a vote of the people. And what's the chance of the people voting for a um, a poop pump <laughs> a poop pump in their park? Oh, it's gonna smell, it's gonna it's gonna break, it's gonna be all over the place. What's the chance of that passing? Right? Especially if somebody doesn't want it to pass. It's pretty easy to create a no campaign on that. So um, but as a result, we had not only bridge, but that everything from the trestle north including the parking area, the rustic shelter, which is not rustic, it's pretty nice, um, the, the dog park, the soccer fields there, the path, both the paved path as well as the natural path on the river, all came as a result of CWS's investment, which would never would have occurred uh, under current charter. So sometimes, um, you know, well-intended or at least highly defensive measures can, can be detrimental in the long run. And it was an issue right here at that quality. Park with the new uh, Sagard Farms, that intersection. In order to widen the road coming up, we've had to encroach on at Faldi Park, we've had to go on the vote of the people to widen just a few feet to extend the sidewalk and so on. The developer wasn't going to do that, we're not going to spend the money, the, the time it would take and all that. Uh, you know, they, they, they had their money invested for two years as it was, so we had to punt, and that intersection is not what it could have been. So, yeah, was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and what do you what do you hope to see looking forward as we work to finalize the uh, the master plan update? Well, the master plan in itself will be will be finished as I said this this fall, and it's it's a virtual laundry list. But it's it, they did a great job of identifying the values that people hold, and so people hold the values of having natural areas, of having easy access for their their families to, of having multicultural opportunities multi-generational opportunities. Um, and, and they want to develop parks. They want to be able to have more ball fields, but they also want to have more hiking trails and more access to the river. So um, the master plan sort of <coughs> encompasses all of those attributes. 
And then every project that everyone can imagine is stacked ranked against those attributes. Prioritized. They're prioritized, but in, 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 in a both a priority of meeting those goals, but also on what's affordable, what's fundable. So the major components are going to have to be come to the vote of the folks on a bond measure. Uh, if you're going to build a rec center, or if you're going to build a river access, or, or even <coughs> perhaps even multiple ball fields, if you do like a, a fourplex ball field. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so so I'm on the uh, the update. Do you know about yeah, it? and one of the things that's been discussed recently has been the issue of SDCs uh, because currently we're one of I think it's four or so cities in this area that does not charge SDCs on industrial and right. commercial property. Exactly. So what do you think the proper balance is between uh, trying to be able to come up with the sure. SDC as a source of funding versus continuing to incentivize commercial and industrial right. development? Right. Well, that's a really great question. And so the, the, the obvious leap is, well, gosh, if all those businesses paid SDCs on their new buildings, we'd have all kinds of money. That's true. Uh, keep in mind that, as I said earlier, half of all of our property tax comes from the resident, from the commercial and industrial community. So um, we have one of the lowest tax rates in the region, and, and we can't change our tax rate. That's, that's something from a, another initiative petition uh, back in the, in the 80s and 90s. Locks in our tax rate, you can't change that. We're $2.24, I believe. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, even during the recession, when other communities were laying people off, hiring freezes and so on, Tualatin actually experienced a growth in revenue every year. Not huge, but some, because they were building resident, or commercial and industrial buildings. Uh, you saw the video of Lamb Research and all the spin-off. So that's already providing at least half of our tax revenue. And so when people go to the library, they go to the parks, they get it for half price. If they have to call a fire department, God forbid, they get it for half price. Um, so businesses are already paying a substantial amount. Can they pay more? Sure. Anybody can always pay more. But at what point do you uh, create enough uh, of, a, uh, of an obstacle that businesses locate elsewhere? Uh, and they will. So you've got to be careful that you don't sort of kill the goose um, <coughs> trying to collect more golden eggs. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. and uh, the other, one of the other things that's been discussed has been the uh, issue of utility fees. Um, that, that's potentially one way of raising money for the park system would be a. Uh, uh, a utility fee, a park utility fee added on to sewer, water, or electric. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's also a great idea. And I think that it needs to be metered to what the public wants. Uh, we passed the transportation bond. Folks said, I'll spend 100 bucks a year more to have some traffic improvements in our town. Uh, certainly, the people who live in Beaverton area and, and that, that area west and north of there, are paying, I think, I will look it up, don't quote me on the camera, but I think they're paying $2 a thousand for a 12 Hills Park and Rec District. I think they're paying $2 a thousand. If that's right, that's about what you're paying for an entire city. So uh, is that a bad thing? No, that's, they've chosen to do that. Uh, so to the, to the part of utility fees, if, if that's a way to fund it or through bond measures uh, for, the, for the building, but you, you, you would do a bond measure to build you would do a utility fee, in my opinion, to operate. Uh, because a bond is like a mortgage. Yeah. So it's over a period of time. But the utility fees is like your electric and water bill at home. It goes on forever. And so um, you know, that's an approach. I think I think the folks in Twalton would be interested in that. If it's affordable, if they knew exactly how it's going to be spent, then they could see improvements in recreational opportunities. Uh, so in addition to the park system, one of the other uh, aspects of well, and that's changed over the past 20 to 25 years has been the issue of uh, retail. We've gained a lot of retail space with the uh, Center Pal property in Niagara Woods, uh, as well as uh, in the Toilet and Commons. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you see as the, the future of retail in Toilet? Do you, would you like to see eventually there being more space zone for, uh, for retail as part of developing a downtown area, or is your thinking more in the direction of residential? Yeah, no, I, you, 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 to build a downtown, you need commercial. <coughs> Whether it's retail, whether it's services, you know, like doctors or dentists or, or and, and restaurants and so on, so you need that anchor, uh, and that's what people people for a downtown people want to have a reason to go downtown. It isn't just like I'm stuck downtown, uh, but let's go downtown and do fill in the blank, uh, and so that's really what it takes to build a downtown. There's got to be an attraction. 
Uh, the commons obviously has the water as an attraction. It has sort of an urban park. You can replicate that in different ways in a, in a different sort of environment. Um, but you need that commercial space. People want to be able to have restaurants. They want to be able to, to, you know, to stroll, to do some shopping. Um, and, and then, but in addition to that, you have to have people, right? So it's a rainy December day. Are you really want to go downtown and for an ice cream cone? Probably not. But if you live downtown and you needed some groceries or you needed a pair of shoes or whatever, it'd be nice to be able to go down the elevator uh, or down the stairs and walk three or four blocks to the shop of your choice. That's mixed use. So it takes uh, commercial to anchor a downtown, but it takes residents to make a downtown flourish. And so yes, it would be folks who live out of downtown coming downtown for a purpose that is set, traction. But then there's got to be that base of people living there. And that's what, that's what mixed use is all about. And as part of the, uh, the, the character and the nature of the retail activity that's going down, on downtown. Recently, there was a, a revision in the city's policy <coughs> towards food carts. Uh, currently, to my understanding, there isn't, there wasn't really a lot of food cart activity to begin with. There was one that was like a uh, frozen ice thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but is the thinking there that in the future, the future of uh, retail and toilet, and at least in the downtown area, is going to be more in the direction of uh, brick and mortar? And what was kind of the impetus behind the change on well, the food cart policy? If you look at again, you look at any newer downtown redevelopment whether it's the Pearl on a big scale, whether it's a Renko out in uh, the Hillsborough area, or, or even redeveloping downtown Hillsborough or downtown Sherwood or whatever, uh, it, it's got to be brick and mortar uh, in order to have it to be sustainable and to, and to be there uh, throughout the seasons. Uh, is, there not, is there a place for portable food? Uh, I think there certainly is. I think folks enjoy that. Um, you know, quite frankly, our downtown, in my opinion, doesn't have the density to support that, uh, other than if you're going to put it around the commons or we already have traction. So the folks that have those restaurants there, quite honestly, and some of them struggle, especially in the winter months. Um, they, they need to make most of their income in the summer. And so if you spend literally millions of dollars in a brick and mortar facility, and then someone pulls up the food cart next to it, and you're not selling your same cuisine if you're taking away uh, you know, some of that revenue, particularly the high traffic time at lunch and, and, uh, and right after work, uh, that's an impact. So I think it needs to be thoughtfully designed. So in Beaverton, they just put a new pot out there. In fact, there's Dominic Beach from um, Beaverton Foods that sort of had that brainchild. But it, it's permanent pots. And then uh, Happy Valley's got a similar sort of thing. So, it, you know, they've got a structure and people get out of the rain and these, these pots can be set up permanently. They don't just fill in a parking lot like you do down at Portland and hope that somebody cleans up the garbage, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't know if there are any questions from the, uh, from the audience about the issue of the downtown. Yeah. Please say your name when you ask the question. Kurt Krauss. Um, Mary talked extensively about moving forward. I'd like to take a look at something about looking back. Now, the, if the society here, and we've got the city, I guess, to thank for for the movement of the church and creating this. But uh, we've identified some historic houses. Is the, is the city council, is the city take, it, taking into account preserving or providing some kind of incentive to maintain those buildings and not demolish them uh, as, as could be in, in the interest of moving forward? Right. First, I'm going to argue with you that don't thank the city for this building. You thank the folks who made this happen. I think there's a historical society and the folks that uh, Larry and, and the whole gang and Yvonne and Boyce and Norman and Norman name names because you leave people out. But um, you, know, you folks came to us 20 years ago and said we need to we want to move that building. You give us a place to land the building, we'll do everything else. And um, and what my concern at the time was is that they could actually follow through on that because the last thing the citizens of Twalton needed was an old building that would be abandoned and run down and left behind if this petered out after a year or two. And here we are, nearly 20 years later, maybe more than 20 years later, lost track of time. And it's a thriving, living building. It's more than just an historical site. It's an activity, it's a place of activity. And it's a learning center, it's a cultural center. And so thank you for that. Uh, we have an historic building ordinance. It's been in place for 25 years. And there's an inventory. 
and inventory on that ordinance are a number of buildings that um, it's not easy to modify, to certainly to tear down, or um, uh, it is possible to tear down. Um, it's possible to to uh, totally lose the asset, but you got to go through a bunch of hoops to do that. You got to you know pretty much exhaust the, the other financial opportunities. Now, what we don't have is public finance to basically save a building, if you will. Um, and we looked at that with the school, the Tualatin Elementary School. And was there, you know, we, we actually pulled the community statistically out of the poll where folks willing to tax themselves to save that building. And we tried to get public investment, you know, with minimums and others. And uh, for whatever reason, well, I know there are a lot of reasons, you know, it, it didn't happen. So, yeah, we can, we can lose a building. But then Robinson Store is another example of where um, we exhausted every possible opportunity. And the backstory on that was, okay, we'll move the building. And, and there was public assistance on that. And I, I, I'm oversimplifying. This isn't exactly right. So don't quote me and, and, and don't, don't um, uh, portray this to Mr. Yamami. But for all intents and purposes, we said, if, if you can move the building, we'll give you the land to put it on. Well, it was more complicated. He didn't get it all scot free, but but it was. And if the building fell down, deal's off. And so um, he did. It. You know, Emmer, those guys. He moved the building and it made it work. But it was people working together. Come on. Please say your name before you start, for the record. My name is Yvonne Addington. I grew up in Tualatin and served as city manager for a number of years. I just want to. Uh, tell you how much I respect what you've done in the time that you've been here. All volunteer, not, no payment for all the burdens you've had to face. I'd like to point out that when you were talking about uh, water, sewer, and roads, and I'm cleaning up the sewer part of it, that uh, the, the original people who were here, there were 800 at the time, went through a similar, very critical problem with the neighbors over the Meridian Park Hospital. It was, they didn't want that sewage going into the Tualatin River, and somehow the people who went to the hospital were sicker than anybody else, and that would be bad for the community. Recently, they celebrated 45 years of uh, service, and they now are a number two employer in the city. I just want to point out that some of the struggles that you've had in the 20 years will produce good results for years to come. And I appreciate all the work you did. I see that you followed all of the original planning and then some, and it's turning out pretty good. Well, thank you. You're very kind of you. <laughs> so, 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 prior councils and, and folks in that in, you know, are Nyberg and, and, and Haas and, you know, and, and Mayor Stolze and, and others and Steve Rose, and it goes on and on, um, uh, for, for basically making the blueprint. And we were able to simply kind of just, you know, color in the lines. Um, it's been great. You know, it's not a burden. I mean, you know, what Chris was to say in, in the Bible, that my, my, my burden is easy, my yoke is light. Um, it's a great community to be part of. And, you know, there's still a lot to do. So as you are doing a lot now, you folks in this room, uh, our future our future's bright. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, is there another question? Then I get the last question. My name is Ross Baker. Okay, Lou, one more term. What would you have done? What would have been the one thing you wish you could have had just four more years to see through? Well, that's a great question, Ross, because I'm not sure that the things that I laid out can be done in four years, but certainly can move forward. But again, the priorities I would do is I would make sure that we can build the Southwest Corridor. I don't know that we can. I don't know that it will pencil. I don't know if there will be enough funding. I don't know if the taxpayers will approve it. It has to be approved regionally. So it's a big effort. But, but we need the transportation mode. Um, so, so that's something that in the, the next four years will determine whether that happens or not. Um, and I, I understand the issues with the village and, and you know, can there be a redesign and how does all that play out? We just, you know, just, just have to play those innings and see. Um, the, uh, the, other big thing is I would absolutely uh, resurrect, if you will, the transportation system plan. 
um, because I think the transportation system plan doesn't service as, as it was adopted five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and I know that's contentious, and there's folks that really, really feel um, passionate about that, which they should. But I believe that that, that needs to that needs to be reevaluated because I don't think it really got a uh, a critical evaluation. Um, I think we need to really be dialed in on our future for drinking water. Um, there's you know, all kinds of issues we can see in Portland and what's going to happen in that regard. And we have we need to make sure that we have a long-term viable arrangement with the city of Portland that we don't end up you know being their uh, primary funding mechanism because more people are dropping out, more overhead to spread. That's important. Um, and then again, I would seriously, we're going to develop a salt creek. That's going to happen. That's going to happen on its own over the next four years. That's the way it's been done. We really need to pursue Stafford in some form. Before the end of this year, I expect to have an agreement between the three cities of uh, jurisdictional areas of interest. It won't be hard lines, but basically when, it, when and if it ever develops, like we will have this, we'll have that, we'll have that, um, and this part won't be developed at all, or whatever, um, but it's all, and then predicated on transportation system plan that supports that. Um, love to see a baseball stadium come to Stafford. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, uh, no, but that, that. that would be great for a whole lot of reasons, um, not the least of which is the economic development. And the residential community, they're talking about doing a full mixed <coughs> use uh, community plan, not just a ballpark. So um, that, that'll be exciting. Um, we need to uh, improve upon the, the West connection. We need to make that more robust. We need to have more service. Uh, we need to have the, the, the better feeders to our industrial and residential area out of that station so we have more higher ridership. <coughs> I would, and I would actively pursue the 12th River access. I would try to work with you with the country club to put access back there. I mentioned that a couple times to the manager, and they you don't slam the door on my face. <coughs> just haven't gotten there. That's enough to keep me busy for a little while. <laughs> well, you're still going to be living in town, right? Yeah, oh, I'm not going anywhere, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, in case it got cut off at the beginning because I was slow getting the camera started, I wanted to mention that today is August 1st. And Graham Alberti, who is going to be a senior at Tualatin High School and has done a lot of great things for us, has been interviewing Mayor Lou Ogden today, who will finish up his term at the end of uh, this year.